good evening and welcome everyone for today's session uh which is thrombophilia how to do the workup and whom we should do the workup for thrombophilia and when and what tests we should do it so first of all i would like to thank uh, indian society of um, <clears throat> indian society of uh, hematology and blood transfusion and dr tufan to give me this opportunity today is very interesting day there is two uh, very important occasion on days so one is sarsthi puja that is vasant panchmi today and other is valentine day so people are confused where they should go but i think who are still with me they are in love with coagulation and uh, for next one hour we are going to have a good time on this valentine day with thrombophilia so i will discuss uh, uh, i will discuss about uh, what is uh, thrombophilia and whom we should test it and what test we should do and how to interpret these test so this is characterized by the increased tendency of venous or arterial thrombosis so the first time uh, the virchow he who is the german uh, physician who give the hypothesis or we called as virchow trial tried where there is tendency to uh, there is some factor which called hypercoagulability and there is alteration in the blood flow that is either slowing or steadiness of the blood or there is endothelial injury or dysfunction which lead to uh, make the situation for the more of thrombosis so uh, normally in our body there is two type of proteins which one is procoagulant and other is natural anticoagulant so they are in a valence formed so they keep the things in valence so the blood when it is inside the blood vessels it flows and whenever there is injury this proteins goes at that site and form a clot when the there is repair of endo that particular endothelium then this clot is lysed by the fibrinolytic pathway that is what we called as normal hemostasis <clears throat> whenever there is any disvalence of these proteins either procoagulant proteins are increased or natural anticoagulant proteins like protein c protein s antithrombin they decrease this lead to thrombosis so before we go into the detail regarding the thrombophilia workup we should understood how the coagulation pathways works so i will try to simplify this complicated which is uh, complicated cartoons which is looking over your screen so as we all know thrombin is the key molecule and it is uh, generated by the activation of either extensive pathway or intrinsic pathway so very interesting thing regarding this thrombin it act as both procoagulant as well as anticoagulant so usually this thrombin uh, i just use the laser point okay so this thrombin convert fibrosin into fibrin monomer and it also act activate factor 13 it's activated form which helps in cross linking of these fibrin monomer and form a stable clot this is this thrombin is also activate factor 8 and factor 9 which is the part of tennis complex and which is uh, responsible for the thrombin burst which is mainly cause the clot formation this thrombin is also activate the tafe that is thrombin uh, activable fibrinolytic uh, inhibitors which check on plasmin so reduce the uh, fibrinolysis along with this this is uh, also the thrombin is also acting as um, anticoagulant in the manner when it combined with thrombomodulin 
it activate protein C. This endothelial protein C receptors, they potentiate the activity of this activated protein C at least 10 times. Along with protein S, which is cofactor for protein C, they degrade factor 8 and factor 5. So when they degrade that factor 8 and factor 5, there is no protrombinase complex or tennis complex. That's how they reduce the thrombin Other parts, if we see the natural anticoagulant like antithrombin or heparin cofactor 2, they inhibit the factor 11, factor 2, factor 10 and thrombin directly. So that's how these natural anticoagulant is also included. Along with that, the fibrillatic pathway is also very important. So as we all know, the plasmogenin converted into plasmin by either erothelial plasmogen activators or tissue plasmogen activators. And this plasmin degrade this fibrin into fibrin degradation. So this Activation is also checked by the plasma activator in inhibitor 1. And there is also uh, this plasma can directly activated by factor 13 or radicanin also. And the inhibitor of for this is Tafi and alpha 2 uh, antiplasmin or alpha 2 microglobin. So, this knowledge we should have before we uh, go into detail of thrombophilia. So, there are Many causes for thrombophilia, we divide it broadly into acquired causes and inherited, uh, inherited causes. So always remember that acquired causes are always common than the inherited. So inherited causes are very rare. So major acquired causes, if we see that surgery is prolonged, immobilization, pregnancy, or concept, or the conditions like uh, APLA, PNH, solid malignancy or hit and so on. If we see the inherited part of this thrombophilia, then there is either loss of functional mutation or gain of functional mutation, like protein C, protein S or antithrombin deficiency, factor 5 medin or prothrombin gene mutation and other elevated factors and so on. So we will go in detail with one of one. So if we see the overall prevalence of these different entities, then factor 5 medium mutation heterozygous is most common one, followed by the other elevated factors. And as we see in this chart, the protein C, protein S, and other uh, rare deficiency is being there. <clears throat> so question comes, whom we should test it? So the recommendation say that inherited thrombophilia cases we have to uh, investigate for these thrombophilia workup and when we decide uh, that there is no other cause or no acquired risk factor associated and it is idiopathic type of uh, thrombosis then we should do uh, this thrombophilia workup. So different guidelines here I have taken from my stage this says the recommendation is I do uh, idiopathic thrombosis that is in young adults less than 50 years or there is history of recurrent thrombosis, unusual site thrombosis like mesenteric vein, splenic, portal or hepatic or cerebral vein thrombosis. This next uh, is first degree of related with thrombosis if they are less than 50 years of age and any event which is occurring uh, during the pregnancy or the patient who is on oral contraceptive pills and they uh, get the thrombotic events. So here is an example. There is two type of situations. One is 25-year-old male uh, diagnosed with pulmonary embolism after a six-hour flight. The other situation is there is 75-year-old male patient who has developed pulmonary embolism. And it is discovered that he has extensive clot in his peripheral inserted center line and post-operately after two days and after a major hip replacement surgery. So, in which case we should do a thrombotic workup? So, definitely we have to do it here because this is a young patient and the precipitation factor is not a major one, it is terrible. So, this patient we have to uh, investigate because it is a young patient, uh, there are more chances of 
homophilia and this power from the history and other things here is multiple risk factor which can lead for um, clot formation or increase hyperprobability so this is a situation where we should not work for the homophilia so again the question comes if anybody has diagnosed with inherited type of uh, homophilia so do we screen all the relatives or not so as we know, majority of these inherited thrombophilia are transmitted in autosomal dominant sessions and they have the variable expression into the uh, other people. So what recommendation says, there is no testing of healthy or asymptomatic children less than 15 years of age who is the first degree relative of a patient with inherited thrombophilia. Because as I told, the penetration is different, the presentation is different, and risk of this thromboembolism is very uh, low. So that's why they, they don't recommend incident children for that. But still, this topic is very controversial, whether the first degree of relative should be screened or not. But finally, what I got from the different articles is this said, the testing can be benefited on selected adult patient because they can be decision making for use of prophylaxis of anticoagulant in the time where the risk of thrombosis is increased like uh, prolonged travel, OCP use or before surgery. So that these are the selected population of uh, uh, persons asymptomatic uh, uh, natives where we can do thrombophilia work before any of this situation. So now you know whom we should test it. So the question comes when we should collect the samples. So the testing should not be performed in acute stage of thromboembolism uh, or any patient who is on anticoagulant therapy. The reason is there is usually congestion of these different proteins of factors or there is increase of other factors which can give you false positive or false negative results. And on when the patient is on oral anti, uh, oral um, anticoagulant therapies or any type of anticoagulant therapy, they can interfere the test which we are going to detect these deficiencies. We should also have a good medical history of the. Uh, we should inquire about the uh, whether the patient is in DIC or having any liver dysfunction or renal dysfunction because they can give you the false results. As in DIC, majority of the factors they consume. In liver disease, there is reduced synthesis of protein C protein as other proteins which are released in the liver or in renal disorders where it is extremely low. So, what tests we can do in these two conditions, either acute phase or the patient is on oral anticoagulant? So, these few tests like factor 5 leading mutation, prothrombin gene mutation, or MTHR or any PCR based testing we can do. Our antigenic assays like anti-cardiolipin, antibody, anti-beta-2 uh, antibody and glycoproteins, we can do it, but not lipocytical. <clears throat> so when we should collect when we uh, the sample, when we are going to do a functional assay or plot-based assay for like uh, protein C, protein S, or anti-thrombic. So as I told, they, they should not be collected during acute phase or anticoagulant or during the pregnancy. They can, if the patient is on oral uh, oral anticoagulant, they can be, uh, sample can be taken if the treating physicians can think that we can stop the drugs for two to three weeks, then the patient who are on vitamin K antagonists, they can be for dogs, usually uh, at least two days washout period should be uh, given, but preferably more than four days. For unfractionated or removal therapy, if any, we can stop, uh, we can give the first dose in the morning and next, after 24 hours, maybe before the next dose, we can take the samples. However, we have to uh, interpret the result uh, with the guidance. If patient is pregnant, and the test is abnormal, then we should again repeat the test after uh, two to three months after the pregnancy. If a patient is oral congruent, then 
other protein, uh, other procognitive factors like factor eight, factor seven, these can be uh, decreased, uh, increased. So the results should be also uh, integrated with the questions. So one thing is very commonly asked in the lab uh, that you cannot take the sample during uh, when the patient is on anticoagulant. So never ever ask the patient to stop the anticoagulant then give the samples. So just uh, talk to the physician and ask them whether he can do it or not. If it is not at all possible that patient is in high risk and they think that we cannot stop the anticoagulant, then it is better going for the molecular testing. So what are the investigation where we can find that this patient uh, having this uh, particular deficiency or this can be suggestive of it. So simple tests like uh, hemogram and typhal is near. If you find macrocytosis, so are we dealing with the increased hemocysteine levels because there is poly uh, or other deficiency can interfere and they can also cause the macrocytosis. Similarly, in sickle cell anemia, the thrombosis is very common. If you find sickle cells on the peripheral bed, that can be suggestive of this the reason for thrombosis. Of PNH, where microcytic hypochromic patient present with hemoglobinuria, you do the PNH testing, so we will find the cause. If the hemoglobin is normal, but platelet count is markedly increased, and marrow shows the great feature of essential thrombocytosis, you know, that is the one condition, or polycythemia, where the hemoglobin is increased uh, below the above uh, cutoff level according to the WHO criteria, then we can. Think of these simple tests can also suggest what could be the cause for thrombosis. <laughs> to come to the uh, particular coagulation test, this is of today's topic. So, what are the screening coagulation tests which we routinely do in our lab, which can suggest it is not confirmatory, but it can suggest what we are dealing with. If APTD is short in and you have ruled out that there is no activation or traumatic samples. And you find the increased level of factor eight fibrogenia or one variant. As I told uh, uh, in last slide, we have seen that these are the increased factor also associated with hemophilia. If the APTD is increased and there is no acquired causes for increased APTD, then you can think of whether it is patient of uh, lupus anticoagulant or it is it uh, factor twelve deficiency because they are also associated with. Uh, Increase uh, thrombosis. If PT and APTD are both are uh, increased, so is it DIC or it is dysfibrosinemia, which is has the propensity towards the thrombophilia? If PT and APTD are both normal, so these are the following conditions which can be done, which can be one of the cause for thrombosis. So we have to do a specific assay for them. So first of all, we discuss what is factor five leading mutation. So it is one of the most common inherited uh, thrombophilia, and uh, uh, prevalence is around twenty percent of new cases who are diagnosed with thrombophilia. So it is mainly these patients mainly present with deep or superficial vein thrombosis and less frequently with uh, pulmonary embolism. There is genetic defect in the point mutation of factor five gene, which leading to the substitution at position 5 gives 6 in arsenic to glutamine. So a simple uh, arm spacer which can, we, we can do where one mutant allele and one is uh, a wild allele. So if this is the positive uh, control here, when this patient, uh, this is control of heterozygous where mutant allele and both wild allele are there. And this is negative control where there is no mutant allele. So this is the patient sample. So after the PCR, we can run the gel and we can find out if there is both are there, then it is a heterozygous for factor 5 leading mutation. If there is no wild, only mutant allele, then it is homologous. So other people, uh, other test which is important is uh, APCR, which is called as SNQ activated protein C. It considered to be a surrogate marker for factor 5 leading mutation. And approximately 95% they show the uh, correlation with this. So, what is happening in uh, this APCR test? 
So this APCR activated protein C resistance is due to because uh, due to this mutation, it evolves the uh, the cleavage of APCR acting on factor V. So that's why the factor V is not inhibited. Where in the normal sample it should be. Okay, so that's why in normally when we add activated protein C, it prolongs the APTT or whatever PT or DRBT based test, it prolongs. But if this factor 5 mutating mutation is there, if they are not able to inactivate this factor 5, so that's why the APTT or other plotting time is shorter. So this is the basically principle for this ABCR test. So it could be, as I told, uh, APTT based or PT based or DRBT of factor 10 based test. So how we do it, we once we uh, incubate the sample with activated protein C and one with the without activated protein C. So the ratio of both if it is more than two, we consider it, it is uh, no mutation in there. If it is less than two, then we consider there is mutation in factor V value. This can also be calculated by the normalization ratio, which the formula is given over here. So if the normalized ratio is less than 0.7, then it is very confirmatory of presence of heterozygous uh, factor V leading mutation. If the values, the ratio is more or less, then we can consider it is for homozygous. So there is limitation of, of this test. This test can be falsely positive when the patient is on anticoagulant in pregnancy where the factor eight levels are increased or if protein C deficiency is there or there is presence of uh, lipos anticoagulant. So these are uh, all things we have to keep in mind when we are interpreting the results of APCR. So other thing which we can do is prothrombin gene mutation. So it is a point mutation and it is the second most inherited cause for thrombophilia. And these patients usually present with DBT and formal imbalance. The risk of thrombin is two to four times as compared to the patient who don't acquire these mutations. So there are PHCR based method where we can do uh, the testing for these tests. Other thing uh, is methylene, <coughs> methylene tetrahydrofolate reactase polymorphism gene. So as we know, this is an important gene which uh, uh, is necessary for the metabolism of homocysteine. So this particular gene has a variable expression and polymorphism. So this uh, can be also do by the PCR methods of different techniques. And there is also increase the level of plasma hemocystine. So come to the tests which we routinely do in our lab. Usually uh, we routinely do protein C, protein S, antithrombin and ABCR. These are the tests which we usually do for uh, in our labs. So as we know, protein C and protein S are the vitamin K dependent glycoprotein and they are uh, act as a natural anticoagulant. So these disorders are usually dom uh, inherited as a dominant uh, uh, autosomal dominant disorders and protein C deficiency could be type 1 or type 2. Type 1 usually a quantitative deficiency when both antigen and activity is uh, reduced in a, a same proportion. However, type 2 is when the antigen is normal, but activity is reduced. So these deficiency, protein uh, C deficiency has high risk of uh, developing the thrombosis in the family. And these patients mainly present with DBT and uh, pulmonary involvement at younger age. And uh, I, we have uh, seen this uh, picture many times that is called neonatal um, particular fulminates, which is due to the deficiency of homozygous or compound homozygous or a uh, um, child with heterozygous where vitamin K antagonist or some other antagonist has been given. So there are two types of assay which is 
meaning present in the lab. The functional assay in antigenic assay. Antigenic assay is mainly ELISA based. In functional assays, either plot based or chromogenic based. So, what is recommended is chromogenic assay because they are they do not interfere with majority of the other variables. So, what is the principle for uh, functional assay? Here we incubate the patient platelet core plasma with phospholipid and contact activator and protein C activators which can be either snake venom or other things, usually snake venom and incubate it for two to three minutes and then add the calcium, the clotting starts. If the protein C is present in the patient plasma, then it lead to innovation of factor uh, 5 and factor 8, which lead to prolongation of the clot, uh, the clot formation. In chromogenic gassing, the patient plasma and protein C activator, which is snake venom, is incubated and then a chromogenic substrate is added, which is uh, which have a chromophore and a synthetic peptide where activated protein C is cleavage at that side and release that uh, chromogenic substrate. So, if the quantity of uh, protein C is present in patient sample, that much protein uh, C will going its activated form and it cleaves that synthetic peptide at this uh, cleavage site and release the promotion. So it is directly proportional. The color of generated by this two uh, substrate is directly uh, proportional to the presence of protein C in the patient sample. So these are the better as I told before that they do not affect it by many other variables. So what we have to remember is the pre analytical uh, issues when we do or interpret these tests. So at least uh, they should not be measured in acute phase as I told and during the anticoagulant. If direct oral anticoagulant or patient is on direct anticoagulant, then they, they can give you the false negative results. However, we can do the chromogenic assay because it will negate these things. If a patient samples, you find that protein C, protein S, and antithrombin all are low, then you are more you should think more of acquired condition like DIC and others because all three uh, proteins cannot be reduced in any patient. So that's why the other testing, uh, other things we have to use, and we should never ever forget the reference range of these proteins especially in the infants and units and child so usually most of the protein c and protein s get normal by the age of six month or one year so next is protein c deficiency it, we know it is act as cofactor for protein c and what is mainly uh, work as a natural anticoagulant is the free protein S. So there are two types of protein S. One is free protein S and other is bound to the proteins. So protein C deficiencies also are rare uh, <coughs> cause for thrombophilia in patients who are present in thrombosis. This could be homozygous, heterozygous or compound heterozygous. So there are a list of various causes which can uh, associated with low or uh, uh, low values of protein C when there is a lipus anticoagulant or any of the uh, anticoagulant oral or heparin they are present in the samples and there is along with that there is also the acquired causes for low protein S that is pregnancy acute reaction or uh, liver disease or DIC so we should always interpret the value in contrast to these factors. So, as I told, uh, that protein S is a cofactor for protein S. So, the assay which uh, to assess the activity or the presence of protein S in the patient sample could be APT, APT or factor 10 or Russell Viper uh, venom time test based. So, these tests, uh, in these tests, what is just a general principle if I tell you then 
as protein S is acting for the cofactor for activated protein C. So it increases the protein density of protein C. So we incubate the uh, patient sample with uh, the patient sample with activated protein C or its activator, and we then try to find out the clotting time. So what is usually uh, we use the test and recommended test to measure the C protein S in majority of the lab. So these tests can be done by the nowadays majority of the automated analyzer latex immunized assay uh, is more commonly used. And total protein S can also measure, which measure both uh, free and bound protein. So how we should interpret the result? So if, if we have all three things, total free protein S and protein C activity, so if all three are decreased, then it is type one. If free total and free proteins are normal, but activity is decreased, then it is type two. If total protein is normal, but free and activity is decreased, then it is type three. So how should we interpret the result of protein S? So if we have done free protein S, which is recommended to do the first test when we investigation uh, investigate a patient with protein C, if it is low and we have uh, already uh, ruled out the all acquired causes, so then either it could be type 1 or type 3. To do the total protein S, if it is low, then it is type 1. If it is normal, then it is type 3 and they should be reevaluated after 4 weeks. If we have excluded the acquired causes and still the protein S is normal and there is a strong clinical suspicion of protein S deficiency, then we should do the activity assay. If it is normal, then we should exclude the protein S deficiency. If it is low, then it is type 2. And again, we confirm after 4 weeks. So another test which we commonly do in our lab is antithrombin. So antithrombin directly inhibits thrombin, but it also inhibits factor 7, 9, 11, and 12 and other things. So this antithrombin deficiency is called hypercoagulable state, and it is the one of uh, the things which is increase the risk 5 to 50 folds as compared to the uh, person who is not having the antithrombin deficiency. So these deficiencies can, so can be also uh, classified as type 1, where is quantitative means the quantity and activity would um, decrease in the proportion. In type 2, that is qualitative, here the uh, antigen is normal, but activity is reduced. <coughs> so these can be assessed by the functional assay. Usually what is recommended is chromogenic assay. Sorry, this. <coughs> recommended is chromogenic assay as compared to the um, activity assay because they less interfere with it. So usually this assay is either uh, thrombin based or a uh, factor 10 based. So what we do here, we uh, take the patient plasma with excess of thrombin heparin and then we rely on that uh, antithrombin which is present in patient plasma will inhibit the thrombin. And we make the reference curve which known value of uh, uh, known sample, known plasma, reference plasma. And then we try to find out how much the activity is present in patient sample. <coughs> there is also other method to assess this antithrombic like ELISA or latex impregnation, which is uh, rarely done uh, nowadays. Majority of the people are doing homogenic assay for antithrombic. So there is a lot of cause, acquired causes which can give you a low antithrombin deficiency. Especially we should, uh, who is working in a hematological setting and they're treating the patient of ALN, they should always remember the patient who have uh, on LS progenics, they have uh, give the false value of low antithrombin. So both anti-10 ASA and anti-10 uh, anti and anti-2 
to that antithrombic uh, related anticoagulant drug, they interfere with these tests, so we cannot assess uh, antithrombin if the patient is on either of this. So, how to interpret the result of uh, antithrombin test? So, if antithrombin activity we have done, if it is normal, we have to find out whether patient is on direct anticoagulant or not. If yes, then we should repeat the test. If no, and there is no other evidence for uh, antithrombin deficiency or other acquired cause, then we can say the patient has normal uh, anticoagulant level, uh, antithrombin level. If it is low, but there is history of recent heparin uh, therapy, then we should repeat the test again when once the heparin is stopped. If there is no heparin therapy and there is no evidence of any acquired things, then we should measure the antigen. If antigen is low, then this is type 1. If it is uh, normal, then we can classify it uh, <coughs> type 2 antithrombin deficiency. Whatever our test results we get, if it is low, all should be confirmed after a repeat testing, at least uh, four weeks apart. So as I showed, we have seen in the first uh, uh, slide that antifibrinolytic pathway is also very important. So it will decide how the clot will lie or it is stay. But the problem is that to monitor or to uh, find these deficiencies, the assays which we do in our lab, uh, majority of the lab don't do these tests because the reality of these disorder and the knowledge and expertise which we required is not, uh, uh, and, and the equipment's not uh, usually available in the lab and the reproducibility is poor. So the condition like dysfibrogenemia, plasmogen deficiency, tissue plasmin or urophilic plasmogen activity uh, deficiency or overexpression of uh, <coughs> plasmogen activated inhibitor 1 or overexpression of TAFI, they all can lead to less neurolysis or decrease conversion of plasmogen to, to plasmid that will lead to uh, hypercoagulant state. So we should always uh, keep in our mind this could be either of the cause for the thrombophilia. So these are the routine tests uh, or the tests which we usually do in our lab. But there is also a rule of uh, can these global assay like viscoelastic intermet like thromboelastography or totem or thrombin generation time or flavor analysis, they can help us to find the hypercoagulant state. Yes, so there are many research papers which show that both in tag and rotem, if the clocking time for our time is shortened, or the MA or this maximum clocking uh, things is increased, it is suggestive of hyperproblemicity. Similarly, for the thrombin generation time, if the lag time is reduced and the peak height is increased, or total thrombin generation potential is increased, they are suggestive of uh, Hyperpopulating states. Similarly, in clot wave analysis, if uh, derivative one and two, the height of peaks are increased or the area is increased, that is again suggestive of hyperpopulating state. So, there's a lot of condition where acquired thrombophilia can be occurred, but I will just discuss the three of one, which is uh, the specific testing is available and that we should uh, know how to do this testing and when we have to do that is one is APLA syndrome, other is PNS and HIT. So as we know for the APLA syndrome or antiphospholipid syndrome, there is criteria either thrombosis, either vascular or pregnancy morbid, either of one along with any one of the criteria that is mucous anticoagulant, cardiolipin or anti-beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody in 98th, 99th percentile for them. So that should be present to make a diagnosis for antiphospholipid syndrome. So when we should do the testing as it is more similar to what we have uh, read in general. So any young patient, unprovoked, unusual site is to make uh, uh, transits 
ischemic attack or stroke, atrial thrombosis, microvascular thrombosis, decreased pregnancy loss. So these are the few conditions where we should think of this. So what are the tests available? Lupercentric augment, as I told, this cannot be done in acute phase and the patient is on oral anticoagulant. But uh, anticoagulant antibody or anti-beta-2 GP1 antibody, they can be done uh, by the ELISA method or the CLIA-based method, which is not present in many of the auto uh, method analyzers. So this can be done. For PNS, the patient usually present with anemia, uh, <coughs> hemoglobinuria, and all those things. So when we suspect a patient who presented with thrombosis, young patient has thrombosis at unusual site like intraabdominal cerebral or splenic vein thrombosis and present with birth chair syndrome and there is evidence of hemolysis or cytopenia. So majority of the lab do uh, this testing for detection of known on uh, WBC, the neutrophil and uh, monocyte as well as on RBCs by flow cytometry test. So other condition uh, which is very important in ICU settings where a lot of preparing or in surgeries, especially in the cardiac, uh, where a lot of heparin is used. So there is chances of developing heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. So the clinical score for probability of fit is usually uh, called as T4 score system, which is a very good uh, probability when the score is high, is 6 to 8. And there is two types of assay to confirm it, either immunological assays or functional assay. The gold standard assay is protein release assay, but it is uh, very difficult to find the radioactive uh, things in your lab. And only for the research purpose it is done. So that is the major limitation of preparing induced platelet activation you can do, but it is again uh, the variability and reproducibility is the problem. So what majority of the people do either ELISA or the lateral flow which is point of care test where it gave you a broad idea about these antibodies. But nowadays uh, the analyzer, they are now get either latex based or cumulonimbus based assay to detect the antibody against VF4. So this is the last slide. Uh, to once a case of thrombosis comes to us, how we should approach it? Is it first episode of thrombosis and we have ruled out all the acquired causes like uh, which can be provoked uh, and a strongest factor for causing this uh, hypercoagulant state? So we should no need to do the work um, of thrombophilia. But if there is no acquired causes, and patient is young, unprovoked thrombosis, and unusual site of thrombosis, or there is different pregnancy loss or sub pregnancy morbidity. Or in, even we should consider the testing in those patients who are young, a strong family history, there is debate on it, but still we can, uh, can take these cases. Or uh, it has been provoked in young patient with uh, weak triggers. So we should consider for workup of uh, hereditary thrombophilia like protein C protein as factor five or dead end mutation or thrombin gene mutations. And according to the situation, we can also work up for the acquired points like the um, APLA, PNH in particular settings. If these all things are needed, then we have to think about the fibrinolytic pathways like dysphagia and other disorders. In some specific situations, like virtual syndrome of total infantry, we should work for PNH and jack mutation. If there is neonatal purpura permanence, then we should look for protein C, protein S deficiency. ICU setting, as I told, we should look for it. And in young patient who is uh, having uh, classical features of SLEs or renal impairment, then we should work for a plus syndrome. If we have arterial thrombosis, then we should look for other things and working. So this is all from my side. And this is my beautiful team, Dr. Ruchi, Dr. Kashyap, who is the head of department, Dr. Manish, Dr. Rahman, and my resident. And these are the 
main person behind all these work mr viswas mrs meena and aslam who works in our cognition lab so thank you very much uh, for patient query and now we can think uh, we can have some question answers if there is any thank you sir uh, if uh, anybody wants to ask the question kindly raise your hands in the chat box uh, sir uh, if you want to send uh, um, any sample um, uh, which non pcr test for uh, thrombophilia workup to any outsource lab so what conditions should the sample be transported okay so uh, means you want to uh, do the functional assays for thrombophilia workup like protein synthesis yes, yes. and recombinant okay so for all coagulation testing first you have to rule out the pre-analytical variables that patient is not on anticoagulant and if we can wait the uh, result the acute phase okay because they can lead to either false negative false positive if these conditions are not there and you want to send the sample so you can collect in citrate bile and make platelet core plasma and then aliquate it and freeze it and then it should be sent to the reference lab in dry ice thank you sir mm, thank you everyone for uh, listening this talk and we with me for on this important day thank you very much thank, thank you, you so sir. much sir thank you. Thank you.